dearest Yusai, what a special treat to be speaking with you today uh, on your philanthropic uh, and cultural diplomacy journeys uh, that straddle the East and the West. Yusai Khan, known as the Oprah of China, is a New Yorker since 1972, uh, born in South China's Guangxi pro province. Yusai traveled and studied across uh, Hong Kong uh, and then Hawaii before she settled in New York uh, and became a de facto ambassador of cultural understanding between the USA and China. Uh, she's an Emmy Award winning, winning television host and producer, successful entrepreneur, fashion icon, uh, author of nine best-selling books uh, and renowned humanitarian. In New York, uh, Yusai came to the spotlight through founding Yusai Khan Productions uh, and producing its long running series Looking East, which introduced Asian cultures to an American audience. Then for China state owned CCTV, she produced a historical uh, or historic bilingual uh, series, uh, One World, which opened the eyes of a billion Chinese to the outside world and made her a household name in China. Uh, after that, through her uh, namesake cosmetics brand, and according to Forbes, Yusai changed the face of China one lipstick at a time. Uh, and Time magazine uh, uh, named uh, Yusai the queen of the uh, Middle Kingdom. As a businesswoman and an entrepreneur, Yusai launched the Yusai Cosmetics brand in 1992, which grew into China's leading beauty company before being acquired by uh, L'Oreal, which appointed Yusai as its honorary vice chairman of uh, L'Oreal China. Yusai was also nominated as the United States Region President of the United Nations Department uh, of Economic and Social Affairs, ECOSOC, with a mission to facilitate the relationship between China, uh, Asian, and French-speaking uh, countries. Yusai is co-chair of the China Institute, uh, a nearly century-old New York-based nonprofit which advances a deeper understanding of China through programs in education, culture, art, uh, and business. Yusai started her charitable journey with 10% of her first paycheck at the age of 19. Uh, in 2011, she founded the Yusai Khan China Beauty Charity Fund to support women and children through education, health, and cultural programs. Dear Yusai, what an incredible uh, journey to date. Uh, a lot of what you've done in your life is around the word beauty. You started a cosmetics empire, you own uh, the Miss Universe China franchise, uh, and uh, you've started a foundation uh, called the China Beauty Charity Fund. Why beauty? Well, a lot of people think that beauty is frivolous, but beauty doesn't have to be. In Chinese, butter, the word beauty means three things. Zhen san mei. Zhen means truth, truth. San means kindness. Mei means physical in inner beauty. So beauty does not have to be frivolous. Now you know that I created a cosmetic uh, company in 1990 in China. In those days, China did not have anybody using cosmetics. Uh, if you all use cosmetics, you're probably either a hawker or, or you are in the theater business. So uh, to make a Chinese uh, population, women population understand the cosmetic, it's not, you have to understand the way we promoted it was that it was really not so much that cosmetic itself is important, but cosmetics can allow us to change into whatever we want it to be. Everyone can be individual, which is an, a concept totally different. A spirit that says that you can be whatever you can. If you can change the way you look, you can be what you are. But you can be more than what you are. So really, more importantly, using cosmetics, I mean, the, the cosmetic company, not only make Chinese women feel very empowered in a way, more importantly, we use the cosmetic company to do a lot of charity work. We, we teach that, well, in a way, we were role model of a, a company that was using our profit to do a lot of, lot of philanthropic work, work that we find that very, very meaningful. Then later on, I, uh, I bought the, Chi the, the Miss Universe China um, 
China um, franchise, right? And then people say, well, you know, you said that it's really very, very uh, frivolous. No, 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 it's not frivolous at all. First of all, we use the final of our charity. It may, we have regionals all over the country. We do, we do um, a charity functions everywhere in the country as we are looking for girls, but for final, the final, final uh, uh, function, we actually use it as a charity event which is really extremely successful. And I always told these girls, you know, you are born beautiful, you didn't earn it. The God gave it to you as a gift. So now you have to use it to do good. So they are also role models for other Chinese women. And I wanted Chinese, young Chinese women to learn to do charity work as well. I know that we're gonna talk about the history of philanthropy in China later on, but I can tell you that this was extremely innovative in China. Um, then my Chinese, uh, my, my, my charity beauty fund, okay, is an interesting one. We created a new a green program for fashion industry in China. What does it do? This is, this is, you know that the most polluting business in the world is fashion business. And China happens to create more uh, or build or, or, uh, or produce more garments than anyone in the world. So pollution is a very big story in China. So what I did was that I created an, a, um, a class actually for Chinese um, executive of fashion companies to come to America to learn about green production. So we teach them from uh, acquiring the products, um, acquiring the ingredients uh, and to production. And at the end, how do you use the leftover material and what about discarded garments? So from A to Z, we teach them how to create a green industry in the fashion uh, world. So this is extremely important because we also use this uh, online. So hundreds and hundreds of Chinese fashion companies can benefit from it. So I think fashion is power. We can do a lot of things with it. That's incredible. Let's talk about cultural diplomacy, which uh, I personally believe is usually underestimated by many, uh, including many here in the Middle East. Uh, you've produced uh, hundreds of TV programs that explain the world to China and vice versa. Uh, and now you are the chair of the China Institute in the USA, which is, as I mentioned, the cultural establishment that is almost 100 years old. Please share with us, what is the mandate of the China Institute and what constitutes success for this initiative? First of all, let's go back to the TV that you mentioned. You know, it's, it's so funny because in those days, the Chinese government couldn't pay me to make television shows. So in a way, all of those television shows I made for the Chinese public on CCTV were really philanthropic work, but that was extremely important. How are you gonna open a country up when you really know nothing about the outside and your population knew nothing about the outside and outside did not know anything about the inside. So that was an extremely important exchange, uh, cultural exchange, actually, seriously. And China Institute, as you know, has been around for so long. A um, relationship between Ch China and the United States uh, is, is been just crazy. It, 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 all these years have been up and down and up and down. And right now is as down as you can be. But my personal belief is that the culture of China, which is 5,000 years old, must be preserved and must be promoted. We promote it we promote it through so many, many, many different ways from music and dance and art and museum and lectures and culinary center. What is really exciting for me is that we are trying to build a ground floor of a two floor charity. Of, and you have to come and visit. And this this place is a is amazing. The second floor we totally built already. It has libraries and everything you can imagine. But ground floor is something we are really doing right now. We are actually creating a development fund for the building of the ground floor. Once we, are, we finish it, it is really the first time a Chinese organization has a front uh, to the street. So it is the only, uh, only home of the Chinese culture that I know of 
in at least in New York City. So it was really great. We have a culinary center, in, in fact, and it was the first time we can promote Chinese cooking as well. You can learn it, we can live stream it. And we have 5,000 square feet of, of, of space we can use for anything we want. We can show movies, we can have fashion shows, we can have weddings, we can have just about anything. So it is very, very exciting. I think that is in, in very, very important. In our language learning, you know, we actually teach toddlers. We teach toddlers, not just only much older people, but little kids, and we have actually a whole classroom for them. It's just cute. They start learning the culture, and some of them are not necessarily Chinese. I think that uh, it's important, no matter what happens, China is still going to be a very important country, and you know that. And I think that the Chinese uh, culture is also a very important culture. I think we're doing our very best to preserve it. I can't wait to, to visit. Um, according to uh, the well-established Turun report, 61% of the world's top self-made female billionaires are Chinese. In what ways do you think this community of increasingly affluent women can affect philanthropy in China, but also around the world? In 1990, when I founded my cosmetic company, I looked around, I was the only Chinese woman who started a business. But a lot of things have changed since then, right? I mean, we have all these women billionaires. Why do the Chinese women get so successful? Did you ever know the, the background? First of all, I think that Chinese women are, are very lucky because when Bao, Chairman Mao said, women uphold half of the sky, it gives Chinese women the freedom to do everything. They are equal in that sense to, to men. And this is extremely important. And in China, not like a lot of third world countries, the Chinese women don't have any problem buying a property in their name uh, starting a business in their name or borrowing money in their name. So actually the sky is the limit as far as the Chinese women are concerned in terms of business. So they have the, they have the ability to do anything they really want. And I tell you, I have girlfriends who do, do the most extraordinary businesses. Like they would, um, they would build very tall buildings that, I mean, contractors, right? I mean, women normally would do cosmetics and beauty salon business and a lot of softer businesses. But I have a girlfriend who owns a marble here, marble mountain, her, her job is to cut marble. It's really quite, quite, quite amazing. Yes, we have a lot of wealthy women today in China, but the, but the difference between men philanthropists and women philanthropists in China is still a very big difference. Out of the hundred top philanthropists in China, only 10 of them are really women. In, in other words, men are overwhelmingly, you know, uh, involved, um, how do you say in English? They're overwhelming, you know, women are still a very, very small number. But I really want to um, talk about China, China, some very interesting uh, Chinese philanthropists. They're, they're local philanthropists. They hardly do anything outside of China. And all of them actually, I don't need to tell you anything, uh, they all do the same kind of businesses. They, they, the philanthropy is on women and children, education, health, and, and poverty allevi alleviation. So these women are very, very interesting. Uh, the most, the wealthiest woman is called Yang Weiyan. Yang Weiyan is the, she's definitely the richest, but her money, the $34 billion really was given to her by her father. The second woman I will talk about is Wu Yajun. She's nicknamed the real estate queen. She is the most wealthy, self-made woman in the world. She's worth $18 billion. The third one is called uh, Zai Mei Jin. Zai Mei Xin is known to be the first woman to have founded a charity in China. And that was 2005. Her, her charity is numbered 001. And since then, she has done. She has helped about two million women uh, around uh, around China, which is a very very successful thing. And the last one I want to talk about is uh, Zhang Yin. She is only worth four billion dollars, but I love her because of what she does. She is nicknamed the Garbage Queen. 
because she imports millions of tons of garbage from outside, from the United States, everywhere, to bring them into China. And she, turn, she turns them into uh, packaging materials. And then she sells it to Coca-Cola and Nike and everybody. And she is, the, she is really the largest paper recycling company in the world. Now, um, I only know four Chinese billionaire women who do business outside of China. Uh, and let me tell you quickly who they are. Chrissy Law, and she founded the Shanda uh, Group is worth $1.5 billion. And she and her husband, they donated $115 million to neuro research. And this is for Caltech and also another $80 million for the Shanghai Huashan Hospital. And also for the same thing, and then mainly on Alzheimer, um, that, that kind of neuro disease. The second one I want to mention, she's Chinese, Dr. Priscilla Chen, who's the wife of Mark Zuberg. Now she runs the charity really, and they really concentrate on education, particularly online learning, uh, online learning. And um, they have pledged, um, uh, they have pledged $4.6 billion to charity, which I think is a pretty nice number. And uh, Jiang Xin, Jiang Xin uh, is a co-founder of Soho China, which is a huge real estate company. And she started as a factory worker and she went to Cambridge. And then later on, she, she and her husband gave $100 million to, to create charity, charity funds to create um, scholarships for poor students to go to international school, international college. Uh, the first one they gave was Harvard. And Clara Tsai, Clara Tsai the, the, she co-founded the Wu Tsai charity and they pledged $220 million into studying new insight into how to improve human fitness. Isn't that interesting? How to improve human fitness. Now, these are the only ones that I know who are doing international, um, international charity. And, and I, I really think that we have a lot to catch up. Thank you so much. Now, that has been really useful to give specific examples of some of these incredible people and the incredible things that they're doing. Would you say that alongside the absolute uh, value of philanthropy uh, that is on the rise, that there is also an increase, increasing institutionalization uh, of philanthropy within China, not just for the large uh, sort of ticket uh, donations, but also more on the retail philanthropy level? Is it being more institutionalized and structured or is it, um, is it still uh, deployed in more traditional uninstitutionalized uh, uh, fashion? It's, well, if you're talking about China, uh, philanthropy is all controlled by the government. If you want to have an, a, a um, charity foundation yourself, it, you really have to go through a lot in order to apply for a, a charity event, cha charity. So charity is very much, um, ah, this is a very good uh, it's time to talk about the history of philanthropy in China, right? Because I really lived through this thing uh, 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 for the last 40 years. And I once, <laughs> I once bumped into Jack Ma and I asked him how he was doing now that he has more money than God. He said, well, you say, giving away money is really difficult. I cannot believe that someone in China would say something like that if it was 30 years ago, because there was absolutely no money in China, right? And it has, like everything else in China, charity has changed so, so, so much and so, so fast. And it, it's, it, I, I can't even catch up with it. But let me try to say something about the history because this is to me probably the most interesting. In communist China, uh, the Chinese government is supposed to take care of you, to give you housing, food, medicine, everything from cradle to grave, right? So I remember when I first started doing charity in China and give away money, they were actually very embarrassed embarrassed to take money from anyone. So they, because they were, they said, well, this is the government's job. And they even that said, you know, 你搞笑吗? 搞笑 means, are you joking that you are giving away money? 
So in 1995, I remember uh, it was the UN's uh, women's conference, the first women's conference ever. And I donated the first year of my Usai Cosmetics money into this uh, to support this through the Chinese Women's Federation, which was the host. And after that, they came to me and said, very sorry, all the money you give, you must give, uh, you must pay tax for it. You must pay tax for the don donation I gave. Well, of course, things began to change. The government started giving you 2%, 4%, 6%, 10%, 12% of, of tax deduction for what you do. And that is very, very interesting how fast they, they actually change. And maybe because China is, charity is, it was a new word in China. And it was, it was so, because it was so new, even as recent about her, um, in, in 2015, I read a charity report that China was one of the least generous nations ranking 144 of the world. So it was not simply in their blood to give money to the public. It was more like giving to their own family and to children. So it, the Chinese have never known to be that generous. And it was actually even in 2016, 10 Chinese, the top Chinese philanthropists gave only a total of $3.5 billion, less than Warren Buffett and Bill Gates, the two of them, a hundred of them. Well, well, I told you already, making a foundation is very difficult in China, right? So therefore it, it, it's difficult to give money uh, like in, a, in America, but something really changed this year. 2021 alone, only seven billionaires have already donated $6 billion. Maybe you ask me why, but well, a lot of things have happened in the last few years. The first thing is the Chinese government enacted a new law in 2016 called the charity law. It, would, it gives uh, people a, a easier way to register a company and it also gives a, a, a better, a broader uh, framework for charity. The second thing is, it's a surprise, is 2017, they actually founded a school, a philanthropy school to teach people how to do philanthropy. Now, this is interesting because Bill Gates and Ray Dalio, Dalio were the two Americans who helped to found this. And this is extremely useful. I think if you really, anyone who wants to learn about philanthropy can go to the school and take courses. However, the most dramatic thing happened this year, which is really propelled by the government. They launched a program called Share Prosperity. Share Prosperity. That really means that it's a big action. It's trying to narrow the gap between the very wealthy to the very uh, unfortunate, I mean, for the poorest people. And they, they launched this program. And I'll tell you something interesting. The two, just give you an example of the two biggest tech company in China immediately responded. Uh, let me give you the real figure. Alibaba. Alibaba donated a total of $15 billion of US dollars into equivalent of one fifth of its current assets. That's to help that program. Tencent, as you know, owns many things, including uh, WeChat, made a net profit of 14 billion US dollars in the first half of this year but a total of 15 billion US dollars was donated in four months. That means it donated all its profits in the first half of the year to this share prosperity initiative. Is that not striking to you? I mean, these are only the two examples. I can give you tons of examples. And during COVID, of course, uh, it's interesting, almost $6.5 million were, were gathered to help to combat COVID from all walks of life, all walks of life. And as you know, China is very, very big on e-commerce and e-commerce is so big today that the live streaming sales is now the hottest sales model in China. During this period of time, many Chinese celebrities get on the e-commerce site and they will sell products from the farms, from faraway places and help the, the farmers and so help them, or the other they would teach the, the farmers how to use e-commerce to sell the products. And that really would help the, the, um, the poor 
in the rural areas in China. And one more thing I want to add, which is that this every year in China now has a event called Charity Day. Have you heard of that? Charity Day. It was the 9th, September 9th every year. This year, a whopping 69 million people participated and over 600 million US dollars was raised. I just thought this is just a, a, amazing. Isn't that a huge difference between those days when people, the Chinese government was actually very embarrassed to get donations? So I will tell you that from my personal point, uh, I want to tell you this story. What, 12 years ago, I, would, I could not sell a charity ticket for more than $25. Two years ago, my charity event sold tickets at $5,000, $5,000. And in less than two weeks, 500 tickets were completely sold out. So I'm really excited about this uh, philanthropy sector in China. And I have, I have seen the growth and I think the future is magnificent. Incredible. No, as you said, and what's clear is that really there's been a step change uh, and I think that's super exciting. Uh, we're seeing some of that with the various studies that the center in Cambridge is doing uh, in different, in other parts of the world, especially across the, uh, the global growth markets. But I think the examples you gave now are very clear examples of how things can change in a very short space of time. And in this case, obviously a very exciting uh, trends. Uh, I wanna ask you about the youth. Um, what are, within the context of what you've just shared with us, what are the youth's attitudes to philanthropy compared to say their parents within China? And how do you think the next generation might change the way that philanthropy is thought about and practiced? Yes, yeah. I started with the Miss Universe contestants, right? And they are already doing a lot of charity work, which is really good. You're right. The young people are much more uh, in China, are much more willing and much more ready to do charity than the much, much older generation. The older generation felt very uh, difficult to just de uh, depart from their money, okay? Apart with their money. The young people have heard the word charity so much and there's so many activities, some of them I've already told you, are going on right now. And a lot of them are participated by the youth. I, I, as I said, the future of philanthropy in China is extremely bright. That's great. Final uh, question, if I may, uh, you, Sai. Um, you know, throughout your work, you have really successfully harnessed the power of partnerships with leading organizations like uh, Prince Albert of Monaco Foundation, uh, UNICEF, and many others. How do you work with them? And what partnership models do you believe work best to maximize the impact of these partnerships? Well, because I work so much with China. So I work everything with the Chinese government to do everything that I do. However, uh, you're right. I was the first Chinese named ambassador at the UNICEF. <laughs> it was so long ago, <laughs> you may not remember that. But, but I wanted to tell you that I was gonna bring a huge, huge plastic whale made of plastic huh? and four and a half story high whale and to, to I was going to send it to China to show the Chinese people that a whale, which is the biggest mammal in, in the ocean, is, is dying of, of, of a plastic problem. Because if you open the bottom, if you open the, the stomach of a dead, a dead whale, you will see that there is a lot of plastic in them. So we, this artist took five tons of garbage to get, to make a four and a half story high whale. I was gonna bring it to Shanghai and was gonna show all the students in Shanghai um, and all, all the population and all the, the citizens in Shanghai that plastic is so bad for the environment. So I was, really eager to do this. And, and Prince Albert heard that I was going to do that. And you know what he said? He said, yes, I do want a, a sponsor. I said, are you kidding me? <laughs> I was so thrilled that, you know, uh, Prince Albert would be interested in, 
helping me actually to do this green uh, plastic uh, project in China. Of course, with his name, it will be phenomenal. Uh, I'm hoping that when the COVID is over, that we would definitely be able to do this. And, and don't you love our friend, um, Prince Albert? He is really quite amazing, isn't he? Truly. Yusai Khan, on behalf of the Center for Strategic Philanthropy at the University of Cambridge, we are truly grateful for your taking the time to be with us today. Uh, this really has been a great learning experience and uh, an important contribution to the work of the Center. So thank you again for inspiring and educating us. And I look forward to being reunited uh, with you together uh, in person soon. Zizheni. Zizheni. <laughs> <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs> thank you.